unleashed by the Parliament. Stephen Conroy has suffered censure by the House of Representatives for telling the commander of Operation Sovereign Borders he's been engaged in a political cover-up. Political correspondent Greg Jennett has been following the debate and joins me now from Canberra. Uh, Greg, just how did the Parliament deal with Senator Conroy? In a very spirited way, James. So pressure had been building all day for Stephen Conroy to do more than simply withdraw his remarks about General Campbell. The government had wanted him to apologise or Bill Shorten to force him to, but neither happened. So former soldier Andrew Wilkie moved a motion to, quote, admonish Stephen Conroy for calling into question the integrity of a Angus Campbell, unquote. Now that quickly found support from the government which launched into its attack through Julie Bishop. She railed against the senator and against Bill Shorten for not forcing an apology. You should have demanded an unqualified apology this morning. You should have stood up in question time and distanced yourself from Senator Conroy. And having unleashed this dog of war, it's time you put him back on the leash. Time you put him back on the leash. General Campbell deserves better than having you, having you use him as a political football to pursue your grubby culture of secrecy. Our military deserve better than having you hide behind uniforms rather than the minister actually do his day job and tell us what is going on. Now, James, that motion never went to a vote. In an abrupt end to all of it, the Speaker declared the motion carried. Labor wasn't happy with that, but the result still stands. Its fourth highest ranking man in Canberra stands censured by the Parliament. Uh, Greg, apart from the government and independent Andrew Wilkie, uh, who else has been sticking up for General Campbell? Well, no one less than the most senior military officer in the land, James. General David Hurley was himself, just by coincidence really, before the estimates uh, hearing processes today. Now, unprompted, he made a statement saying that a shadow will linger over Angus Campbell, whom he describes as a man of integrity, intellect and studied impartiality. Stephen Conroy did respond to General Hurley by saying that uh, the government is his target, not the military officers who ha just have to carry out the orders. I was surprised at the accusations made against Lieutenant General Angus Campbell. I am pleased these accusations were withdrawn, but unfortunately once said, the shadow will linger. I have no criticism whatsoever of service personnel carrying out the government's orders. Now, James, there are Labor MPs critical of both Stephen Conroy and also privately of Bill Shorten for letting this run without an apology for a full day now. Greg Jennett's in Parliament House. Thank you. The Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has announced a $320 million package for drought-stricken farmers. It includes money for concessional loans and cash to help farmers access more water and eradicate feral animals. Mr Abbott has also promised there will be more relief if conditions worsen. No such luck, eh? <laughs> the Prime Minister has rounded up some help for cash-strapped farmers. Some of you might be inclined to say, well, uh, this is a special deal for farmers. No, no. Um, this is akin to a natural disaster. But will it be too late? Why it has taken so long is for the Prime Minister to explain. But many struggling farm families will be asking that question today. And is it enough? Since the, uh, the millennium drought ended, we've had, well, we've had three or four years or more, and we still don't have that long-term solution. The package is worth $320 million. It includes investment in concessional loans to take off the financial pressure, more funds for water infrastructure, money to deal with feral animals and funds to manage the mental toll on farmers. The next part is to make sure we maintain the dignity of the house. The dignity of the house so that people can pay, um, for, pay their chemist bill, uh, keep their power on, uh, keep their phone on. Attention in the rural community will now turn to how the assistance is used and whether it supports good farm practices. 
these loans are not to prop up unviable businesses, they are to help viable businesses to adjust to the drought. Cabinet agreed to the drought deal last night, but the ABC understands there are some in the party room who are concerned about how it will be received by voters. One Labor frontbencher has already raised concerns about a government double standard, that the deal for farmers isn't being extended to other troubled industries. Anna Henderson, ABC News, Canberra. The Australian Electoral Commission has revealed almost 2,000 people have admitted they voted more than once at last year's federal election. The Commission has investigated almost 19,000 cases of multiple voting. Most were the result of clerical errors, but one voter admitted casting 15 ballots on election day. The ABC's election analyst Anthony Green says while it's a minor issue at every election, it needs to be addressed. If this was a business, you wouldn't worry about it because the incidence is so low. But of course it's an election, so you want the incidence to be close to zero and as close to zero as possible. The vast majority of multiple votes are either clerical errors or confused elderly. But any tightening up of rules of this sort, you might knock out this tiny number of multiple votes, but you're actually going to knock out more people from voting who should be allowed to vote. A former resident of a state-run girls' home has told the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse she endured rape and abuse from her first week at the home in New South Wales. Faye Hillary was sent to the Parramatta Girls Training School in 1958 at the age of 16. Lucy Carter reports from the hearing. It's only the first day into this case study looking at the Parramatta and Hay Girls Institutes, but already the stories we've been hearing are graphic and violent beyond measure. We've heard so far from one witness, Faye Hillary, who says that she was repeatedly and violently raped by the superintendent at the time, whose name was Donald Crawford. He is now deceased, um, but is one of ten people that have been identified so far as perpetrators, nine men and one woman. Another 15 women are due to give evidence over the next three days here at this inquiry and it's understood that the inquiry will be looking at things like statute of limitation laws to see whether compensation can become an option for these women. There's also the possibility that of the three perpetrators that are still alive, charges could be laid. The manager of three-time Olympic champion Grant Hackett says the swimmer has flown to the US for treatment for a drug dependency. Chris White issued a statement saying the gold medalist has become addicted to the sleeping pill Stillnox. But Hackett has told American media he's in the country on a retreat and not for rehabilitation. The latest development comes after he was seen semi-naked in the early hours of Saturday morning at Melbourne's Crown Hotel searching for his four-year-old son. The Australian Federal Police is facing legal action in the federal court over its raids last week on the offices of Network 7 in Sydney. The AFP obtained warrants to search the network's Piermont offices and other premises for documents. It was part of its investigation into whether convicted drug smuggler Chappelle Corby would profit from telling her story. On Saturday, the AFP apologised for an error on a letter attached to the warrant, which said Seven's solicitor was reasonably suspected of a crime. Seven says it's asked the court to review the issue of the warrants in a bid to set the record straight and recover seized material. In Victoria, an emergency warning has been issued for a country by the Country Fire Authority for Ricketts Marsh. There is a fast-moving, out-of-control grass fire travelling along McDonald Road and Mool Eric Road in Birragurra. People in the area are advised it is too late to leave. The safest option is to take shelter indoors immediately. Concern about carbon monoxide levels in Victoria's Latrobe Valley are growing. Police say the coal fire that's been burning at the Hazelwood Power Station for 15 days was started by arsonists. Jackie Peake reports from Morwell, where residents are worried about toxic smoke blowing across the town. Well, there's a lot of concern in the community after police revealed that an arsonist or perhaps multiple arsonists were responsible for this coal mine fire which burns behind me at the Hazelwood coal mine. This fire broke out on February 9th and police have revealed that three fires were lit in the area at a rural community called Driffield on that afternoon. Earlier in the morning they say what they term a test fire was lit nearby in the Hazelwood area and on January 28th they say an early 
earlier test fire was lit by these arsonists who they believe are local and police have been interviewing people who are known arsonists in this area. Now um, ambulance uh, paramedics have also been advised uh, that if they're pregnant or wishing to get pregnant not to work on the staging ground at this coal mine fire because of uh, fears about their safety. Police Chief Commissioner Ken Lay has said this morning that uh, police have also been advised of uh, this same warning. I take the advice that's given by these people, by the experts. Um, they put out the warnings, um, uh, certainly I believe as best they can. Um, it is a really difficult situation and um, clearly there are tensions growing in the community and I suspect will grow in the community until this fire, fire is put out. Now this fire escaped the coal mine yesterday, burning through grass towards the power station. It got within about 400 metres before it was brought under control. Smoke is still posing a huge problem for the community of Morwell and uh, surrounding communities in the Latrobe Valley. Council has been out door knocking today, making sure that residents are OK and residents with any serious health concerns are being told to either leave the area or go to some of the uh, relief centres that have been set up. Turning overseas, and now that they're in power, Ukraine's opposition groups are frantically trying to keep the country together. While they face tough decisions, more of the old regime's lavish spending has been revealed. Europe correspondent Mary Guerin reports. With the country in turmoil, Ukraine's parliamentarians are desperately trying to get organised. The interim leaders extended their own deadline to form a unity government by a couple of days. We need urgently to hammer out this deal. But the MPs know they'll have to impose unpopular reforms. You know, to be in this government is, it to, is to commit a political suicide. And we need to be very frank and open. This is the political suiciders. The EU's foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, met with the newly freed former Prime Minister, Yulia Tymoshenko, and promised strong international support for the country's new leaders. Europe's also indicated it will help support Ukraine's plea for more than $38 billion in aid. I would also support uh, an idea of a donors' conference uh, for Ukraine Meanwhile, the hunt for the ousted president, Viktor Yanukovych, goes on. Ukraine's parliament voted that once found, he should be sent to the International Criminal Court to be tried for aggravated mass murder, relating to the deaths of more than 100 people. And it issued the same ruling for the former prosecutor general, Viktor Shonka. He's also on the run. His home is now on display, an insight into the opulent lives of the country's elite. In one reproduction of a famous painting, the former prosecutor's face is transposed onto the figure of a Russian field marshal defeating Napoleon, a posture of victory that seems more fictional than ever. Mary Guerin, ABC News. The Islamist militant group Boko Haram has killed 59 students at a school in Nigeria. The students, all teenage boys, were locked in a dormitory that was set alight and destroyed. Officials say children who tried to escape through windows were shot. Boko Haram wants to establish a new state under strict Islamic law and thousands have been killed in fighting in recent years. A UK judge has ruled a suspected IRA terrorist will not have to stand trial for murder because government officials mistakenly assured him he wasn't a wanted man. John Downey has denied planting a bomb that killed four soldiers and several horses in London's Hyde Park in 1982. He and many other terror suspects were later given immunity from prosecution under the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement. A London judge has ruled he can't be tried because the original agreement must stand. Victims' families say they're devastated by the judgment. Former News of the World editor Rebecca Brooks says she hadn't been aware of the, that phone hacking was illegal. Ms Brooks has told her phone hacking trial in London she had never been asked to sanction the practice. She says she only became aware phone hacking was a crime when a former private detective working for the paper and its royal editor were arrested in 2006. A judge has ruled that television cameras will be allowed at the murder trial of South African athlete Oscar Pistorius. The Olympic and Paralympic track star admits he shot his model girlfriend but claims he mistook her for an intruder. Prosecutors allege the killing was premeditated. The media has started preparing to send out live broadcasts from the case, which starts on Monday. 
The World Health Organization has expressed concern about the long-term implications of air pollution in China. Chinese weather officials estimate around 15% of the country has been covered under a toxic heavy smog over the past week. China correspondent Hui Fen Tei reports from Beijing. Thick haze has smothered Beijing for the past week, raising air pollution levels to 15 times the safety level recommended by the World Health Organization. Beijing's government has refrained from issuing a red alert, the highest in a four-level system that was introduced last year. A red alert is issued if the air quality index exceeds 300 for three consecutive days. It would mean shutting down schools and restricting the number of cars on the road. The WHO is refraining from recommending the government do that as well. These thresholds have been set in a certain way. Um, maybe one can question that and say one should put these measures in, in, in place earlier, but it all, all has pros and cons and we don't really have much information or scientific information to base this on. You know, should, should this be a slightly different measure? Chinese weather officials say the smog has affected around 15 percent of the country. There is some evidence that the kind of uh, fine particles will direct impact on this kind of cardiovascular disease, you know, or some kind of uh, increase, like a 30 percent increase, that, and also, uh, you know, eventually impact on chronic lung disease, maybe for lung cancer. Many building projects in the neighboring province of Hebei have reportedly shut down and the construction of a new subway line here in Beijing has apparently stopped as well because of the smog, which has greatly reduced visibility. This haze is forecast to last until Thursday. Hui Fente, ABC News, Beijing. One young Indian comedian is about to find out whether laughter really is a universal language. Two Australian comics have spent the past fortnight scouring India to find the country's best new talent to perform for a crowd of thousands at the Melbourne International Raw Comedy Festival. Stephanie March reports from New Delhi. Remember that leave thing we were going to have in front of Mahesh lunch is home? For Australian comedians Kate McLennan and Justin Hamilton, the past two weeks in India have been about more than just sampling the local cuisine. That's a good question. It doesn't have to be a segue. Like Sometimes you can actually just uh, tell the story that you want to tell. The pair have been holding competitions and workshops across the country on the hunt for India's next big name in comedy. The level of professionalism in these young comics is quite fascinating. They've only, some of them have only got about six months experience. The stand-up comedy scene in India is relatively young, but there's no shortage of talent. 